قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأولين والآخرين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته And welcome to this live episode of Ask Zad coming to you every Saturday after Maghrib prayer here in Mecca region Our first Three questions from the emails as usual before we take your live questions. The first one is from an anonymous. He says, many people in my culture, after the parents go and see a woman for their son, they come back and discuss about that lady's features with almost all the family members. Like they say, her nose is fat, she's fat, she's short, etc. Is this backbiting? First of all, this is a cultural error and a sin. First of all, because unfortunately I've talked to some of the people, even to some of the da'is from such cultures, who insisted to meet the girl. And I said to him, Who's getting married, you or your son? He said, no, my son is getting married, but I have to interview the girl. He said, subhanAllah, this is not from the Sharia. This is not definitely from the Quran or from the Sunnah. Nowhere ever this was found in Islam. Where are you guys getting these things from? Either you're following Sharia or you're following your whims and desires. And without any doubt, this is following the whims and desires. In what religion is the father of the to-be groom goes and meets the girl and sits with her and interviews her? Isn't he a male? Doesn't he have desires? She's not his daughter-in-law yet. What happens if he likes her? What happens if she likes him? Why do we have hijab? So people are drifting away from Islam. And they never ask themselves, are we following Sharia or our whims and desires? Because they know the answer is going to be definitely whims and desires. Though if you ask everyone on earth, among the Muslims, what do you want to follow? Sharia or whims and desires, definitely 100% would say Sharia. They don't have any other choice. If they say otherwise, this means that they don't want Islam. But when you implement this rule, this question, and cascade it to their lives, you'll find that 90% of them are not practicing. They're not implementing Sharia in their lives. They don't want it because it goes against their whims and desires and uh, culture and traditions and the things they want. This is... Point one. Point two, when they come back home, talking about the girl who is a Muslim, falls under backbiting. Because the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, in definition of backbiting, it is mentioning your Muslim, individual, brother or sister, with something he hates. So when the mother talks to her daughters, the daughters are not getting married. They, she talks to the, her daughters and say, oh, she's short, she's too tall, she's too thinny, uh, she's fat, she's b white, she's dark, she's ugly, she has pimples in her face, she has this, she has that. All of this is backbiting. And she's sinful and all those sitting with her. Now, if she's sitting with her son who's interested in marrying and she talks about him to describe her to him, 
so that if he likes what he hears, he goes and proposes, that's not backbiting. This is totally halal, but it has to be one-to-one, -one. not with her husband around, not with other sons or daughters who are not involved in this selection issue. It's the boy who is interested. So she says to him, she's fair, she's beautiful, uh, but I don't like the way she speaks. Uh, she's a little bit loud. She, her hair is uh, too soft. There are no curls in it, this and that. Yes, this is okay because the boy is buying. So we have to market the product. And the same thing happens when the father or the mother of the, of the girl talk to her and say to her, the boy has this, the boy has that. The boy doesn't have this, the boy doesn't have that. This is not backbiting, it's only to help her make her mind and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Uh, Talal says, a scholar from a certain country says that the earning of YouTube becomes halal on halal products, even if they are advertised in a haram way where there is showing off of girls and music. He also says that if you still have any doubt, you can give 10% of your earning in sadaqah. Is he right or not? The answer is displayed and shown to us in Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, in the very beginning, where Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ Collaborate and cooperate upon righteousness and virtue. And do not collaborate nor cooperate on sin and transgression. This is a general statement. Any contribution from my side would be haram if I'm promoting haram. So I have a YouTube channel and it's not monetized with the grace of Allah till now. And people come and say, why don't you monetize it? You'll get a lot of money out of it. I would say, okay, where is the money coming from? Is the money coming because my material is good? They said, no, you could have porn and still the money would be pouring in. So why, why is the money coming in? They say, because you allowed monetization. You allowed them to put advertisement and the advertisers pay YouTube money and in return, they pay you money. So I said, aha, uh -huh. so who gives the green light? said, you, you're the owner. If you want to monetize, then they will put, do I have any control on the ads? Said, no, there will be music. There will be women not wearing the hijab. There will be a lot of haram things. Rarely you will find something that is halal. Do I have any control over it? Said, no. In this case, I am the one who's pushing the button. I'm the one who's blowing the whole place up. I'm the suicide bomber, as they say then I'll go straight to hell because it's my doing. Now, if they were to enforce advertisements, whether you like it or not, this is a different issue. And I hope it doesn't happen. But if this happens, in this case, because the advertisements are shown and displayed, whether you like it or not, you can monetize it, but it would be like interest money given to you on your bank account without your approval. What to do? I have no other source to, to, to deposit my money in a bank without them putting interest money on, which is haram. Okay, no problem. Keep the bank account, take the interest, and uh, uh, dispose of it in charity. Likewise, take the money generated by the advertisements, all of it, and dispose of it in means of charity, not to get closer to Allah, rather to cleanse your wealth from such haram money. As for the scholar who said what he had said, this is his opinion, but opinions are yani, cheaper by the dozen. They, they, they come 
and go. Not every person who gives fatwa, who gives a, an opinion, falls under the rulings of the Quran and Sunnah. This is common sense. So the explanation I gave to you is crystal clear. No advertisement would, would mean no money. So advertisement that are haram would equal revenue and money. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to know and understand that you are the cause of such haram advertisements and you're making money out of it. Giving 10%, giving 50%, giving 99.9% .9 does not make it halal. Giving 100% when it's come, uh, 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 obligatory upon you to have these advertisements, whether you like it or not, that's a different issue and Allah Azza wa knows best. Finally, Sabrina says, is it permissible to have GoFundMe pages to raise money for our education and necessary things that we need? It seems that what uh, um, uh, she is asking about, uh, I think it's a web page where you put your problem like I'm homeless, I'm sleeping in my car, and I don't have any money to pay for uh, the gas, and I need uh, money. So people read this, random people, they share it on Facebook or on Twitter accounts, and sometimes they pay something that would make a lot of difference in a person's life, and sometimes they, they, they won't pay anything. So what's the ruling on that? First of all, this is virtual begging. Asking people for money is begging. And the more you ask, the more firestones you'll gather upon yourself in hellfire. And the Prophet had made it clear, alayhi salatu wasalam, that it is not permiss permissible to beg, to ask people for money, except for three. One, a person who's totally stone broke and he brings three male witnesses to testify that this guy is totally broke. He doesn't have a thing. This person can beg for what suffices him not to become a rich man. Secondly, a person who was affect affected by a calamity, a disaster, like a volcano, a flood, um, a fire that swept off and destroyed everything he has. So like a person who has business and fire destroyed his shop and warehouse, now he's totally broke. So what can he do? He can beg and charity is halal to such a person. Thirdly, a person who undertakes loans in order to fix between two fighting and disputing tribes or factions or parties. So I know that these two families are having a dispute, conflict, fights, they're having wars. So I come to mediate, mediate to arbitrate, and say, listen, you're right, and he's wrong, and you're wrong, he's right, so, so. But to make a long story short, I will compensate you with so-and-so, and, -so, and I will compensate you with so-and-so. -so. so I take upon myself financial loans to fix what was broken between them. In this case, I am entitled to ask people to compensate me. This is taught. These are the three cases where the Prophet Hassan says, Begging is halal. Other than that, it is one of the major sins that people would come on the day of judgment without any piece of meat on their faces because of them begging people. GoFundMe or other means of begging is the same and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Uh, Hameem from India. Hameem. Ya Hamim. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my question is 
most of the people have said to me that my name is inappropriate because uh, it is it does not have any meaning and i should change it because we should not have names based on surah so is it right should i change my name okay i will answer you inshallah and uh, sami from the uk assalam alaikum sir shamtullah i just wanted to ask um, how how do you go about disposing any papers that have allah's name on it i could not understand your question how do you go about disposing any papers that have Allah's name on it? How to dispose any paper that has Allah's name on it? Okay, I will answer, inshallah. And we have Abu Uzair from Holland. Abu Uzair. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. I hope all is well, inshallah, with you. Alhamdulillah, everything is fine. What can I do for you, my friend? So, what are the six exceptions of backbiting? Oh, this is a, a, a quiz. No, no, like, like I think... I know, I know, I know. Oh, okay, okay. I understand, but I don't memorize them. If I memorize them, I would have been one of the uh, major uh, ulama uh, council, but I'm from the minor... Small uh, ulama. Okay, I'll answer you to the best of my knowledge. Sarah from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamualaikum. Um, so, Sheikh, uh, ever since I've shifted here, I don't recognize my family anymore, particularly my brother, who was very serious in practicing Islam ever since we have come here. He rarely cares about his salah. And... Um, me also, I've been facing a crisis of faith ever since I've been here because I'm seeing people, they are enjoying their life. And I, um, I, I don't like, I, I avoid moving out of the house because of the fitna here. So can you give me some advice, inshallah, because I'm finding it very hard to yeah, any practice nowadays. I will do, inshallah. Muhammad from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Sheikh, my question is, there are some people who live three buildings away from the mosque. So the mosque is near. Uh, they usually pray in the mosque with the congregation, but sometimes when they feel lazy, they miss. And they say they would not be able to hear the adhan in its natural voice, that is without the mind. So they say it is not mandatory for us. Is this true? Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Kareem from Holland. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu um, my question is uh, about praying in congregation. Um, when I'm working, I uh, am uh, the mosque is pretty far, but sometimes uh, I think uh, I have to go. Or if I don't have to go, should I uh, search for Muslims in uh, the building to pray with? So um, yeah, my question is actually, when do I have to pray in congregation? And if I have to go to a mosque, how far does it have to be? Okay, I will answer, inshallah. Masha from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Um, Sheikh, my question is, I um, recently found out that um, I have a savings certificate and the amount that I put it in when I invested first, I found out the profit that the uh, government gave in my native country, it is um, considered as, as interest and... Uh, I want to, uh, what I want to do is I want to keep the original uh, investment that I put, for example, $2,000 and whatever profit that it made with, I want to cleanse it away. I want to give it away. What is the best way to do it? Okay. I will answer, inshallah. Uh, Yusuf from Holland. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Is our all fermented foods haram? For example, Fanta, it has some uh, fruits in it and it may be fermented. Is it, does it make it haram? What, what is? Fermented foods, drinks. Fermented food, does it have alcohol in it? No, uh, I don't know. How would I know? It, it, does it intoxicate if you drink five or six bottles? I don't know. No, I cannot also answer you. I will see, inshallah, what I can uh, come up with. Uh, we have Um Abdul Rahman from Saudi. Barakatuh. Barakatuh. My, quest, my question is uh, regarding illegal immigration. 
I wanted to know, according to the the Sharia, exactly. I mean, according to the Sharia, what is the ruling regarding um, people who are not from the a particular country coming in illegally, crossing the border, and uh, you know, uh, accepting benefits from the country when they don't pay taxes. Um, I, I I I understand that long ago there weren't any borders and that people can move about from country to country without um, paperwork, without visas. So according to the Sharia, what is the ruling about this? Okay, I will answer, inshallah. Uh, Hamza from Bosnia. Assalamu alaikum. Jantullah. Uh, Shaykh, my question is about those people who keep dogs outside their house. I know that it is only per permissible if it's for security reasons or for hunting, but what about those people who keep dogs outside their house but the dog is chained, meaning the dog has a chain around the neck, so, or maybe the dog is in his box or cage. Can such people claim it is for security reasons, okay. but we know but we know if there was somebody to rob their house, the dog wouldn't be able to repel the house. I will answer, inshallah. Muhammad from the Philippines. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. If one is an interpreter and then he prays, for example, the whole prayer in the masjid with the congregation, after praying the word in the masjid, can he combine and shorten Asr prayer? Why would he combine it with Asr prayer? Uh, because it's a traveler, Chef. Is, that, is it permissible, Chef? Okay. I will answer, inshallah. Uh, Ashhad from Bangladesh. Okay, I think we lost Ashhad. Uh, Laween from Canada. Hello. Laween. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, is it permissible for us to give pets names, and if so, which names are permissible in Islam? Jazakallah al khair. What jazak? And uh, Ahna from Bangladesh? Waalaikum Sheikh. Waalaikum Sheikh, wa barakatuh. Sheikh, what's the difference between Quran, Hadith, Qudsi, and the normal Sunnah Duas? Okay, I will answer, inshallah. And Muhammad from America. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu Sheikh, I recently sent in a question to your emails about the man who found money on his legs after performing ghusl. Do you remember that? I have 150 questions a day. So I remember something like that, which is not very normal, because if you take ghusl, Money is not something that is gluish. If you put water on it, even for a little while, it will dissolve by itself. So most likely this wasn't many, but okay, assuming it, it was. Your question. Okay, Sheikh. So he performed all the prayers that he did since being in the state of major impurity for a second time. So he performed, he performed them in the order that they originally came. He performed Asr, Maghrib, Isha, Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and Fajr again. And he took his time while using the bathroom and performing Ghusl, which means that he did not hurry. And he took small breaks in between the prayers that he re-performed. So are his prayers now valid and is there anything else that he should do? Okay, I will answer, inshallah. Uh, Nashim from the Philippines. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you, Sheikh, for helping me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for enlightening me about Islam. Amen. And my question, Sheikh, is my salah valid if, if I pray my prayers in our house, uh, especially the Fajr prayer, because they are done in the masjid, cannot reach in our house, and to reach there in the masjid, it takes usually seven minutes to eight minutes. Only seven minutes to reach the masjid? Yes, sir. Okay. And the Adan is couldn't reach in our house. Okay, I, I will answer you, inshallah. Fuad from Bangladesh. 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh dear Fadilatul Sheikh Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Fadilatul Muttasil How are you Sheikh? I'm doing great alhamdulillah How can I help you? Sheikh, my question is What's the ruling on drawing the pictures of bacteria and virus? What, what's, what's the ruling on what? What's the ruling on drawing the pictures of bacteria and virus? Okay I will answer you, inshallah. Uh, CD from Germany. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamualaikum. How are you, Sheikh? Uh, good, alhamdulillah. Um, Sheikh, what's the ruling on stunt meat? Because in Germany, for example, it is unfortunately forbidden to slaughter a land living animal without being pre stunt. And the issue is we don't know if the animals died or were they being pre stunt before they were slaughtered. So, should we avoid such meat? Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Um, I think we have a short break. Stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader, Abu Huraira. Radiallahu anhu said that a man came to the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and said, O Messenger of Allah, poverty has struck me. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam sent a messenger to one of his wives to bring something for that man to eat. But she said, By the one who sent you with the truth, I only have water. He sallallahu alayhi wasallam sent to another one of his wives, to bring something for the man to eat. But she said the same, until all of them said the same thing. Then Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Who will take this one as a guest in exchange for Allah's mercy? A man from the Ansar said, I will, O Messenger of Allah. So he took the man to his home and said to his wife, Treat the guest of the Messenger of Allah well. She said, By Allah, we have nothing except the meal for my children. He said, Get the food ready and light the lamp and put your children to sleep. If they ask for dinner, then when the guest enters, dim the lamp and make it seem as if we are eating. And when he reaches for the food to eat, then stand up to the lantern and turn it off. She got the food ready, turned the lamp on, and put the children to sleep. She then went to the lamp as if she was fixing it and turned it off. Then they pretended as they were eating and they both went to sleep hungry. In the morning, the man from the Ansar went to Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who said, Allah has laughed, implying his acceptance to the deed from your actions last night. Then Allah revealed his saying, which means, and they give them preference over themselves, even though they were in need of that. Reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Hamim from India says that a lot of the people talk to him and say that you have to change your name. And I actually do not know what his name is. Is it Hamim or Hamim, as in the letters that some surahs begin with, like Dukhan and, 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 and other, uh, other surahs? Hamim, two separate letters. If it is the latter, then he has to change his name because it is not permissible according to the majority of scholars to use the names of surahs or the beginning, especially letters. Imagine someone's name is Kaf Haya Ain Saad. This is inappropriate at all. But if the name is one word, Hamim, this is mentioned in the Quran and it means close so 
صديق حميم a very close friend and there is nothing wrong in keeping this name حميم which I most likely think that it is a one single name حميم while the other one which is not permissible is ح then space ميم this is that uh, has to change and Allah knows best uh, Sammy from the UK he says if we have a piece of paper that has the name of Allah how to dispose of it? If the name of Allah is written in Arabic, it must be respected. Whether it's Al-Rahman, Al-Aziz, Al-Kareem, these names of Allah that refer to Allah must be respected if written in Arabic. And to dispose of them, you can either burn that piece of paper or shred it beyond recognition. So if you have a good shredding machine, put it in it, it comes out from the other end. You cannot tell what was written on it. That's okay. The third option, which is a little bit more difficult, is to bury it somewhere far uh, or to soak it in water in a river, but maybe this would be polluting the environment and they may fine you for that. Abu Uzair from Holland, he says, what are the six exceptions of Ghiba? Imam Nawawi, mentioned those and he explained them there is poetry combining them i don't remember what i had for lunch yesterday i'm too old to do this but generally speaking these six issues relate to advice and warning so say they say if someone comes to you to ask you about a person they're about to get in a business with and you know that this guy deals in riba and steals money and he would cheat him so you have to tell that individual no this person does this and that related to his question if a person got a proposal from a man who's interested in his daughter or his sister and you know that this guy is a junkie or a drunkard or he doesn't pray but nobody knows this about him. You do. So you have to warn him. If you have a problem with someone that requires you going to the judge and you say, this man broke into my house and stole my wallet. No one would say that, oh, this is riba. No, you have to do this. You have to tell the police. You have to tell the judge about the crime he had committed. And this is not backbiting if you know of a person going to seek knowledge from someone who's not trustworthy not a scholar not from ahlus sunnati wal jama'ah rather he's an innovator or he has corrupt aqidah and you have solid proof that the knowledge he's giving is totally bogus and corrupt not because he made one single mistake in his lifetime you tarnish his reputation. No, I'm talking about people of deviancy, of bid'ah. Then yes, you have to warn the individual by saying that this is not uh, uh, a, a good person to learn from, it's haram for you, etc. I don't know, four, five, maybe, I don't know, who's counting? Uh, number six, maybe, just to conclude, if I can warn someone who has authority over someone who's below him. So I know a friend who does drugs, or I know a girl who's behind her father's back is having an affair with a boy. And I've advised these people and they would not listen. If I advise or talk to her father or his elder brother and say, listen, Akhi, your brother is doing this and this and this, and I'd like you to intervene diplomatically in a good way, find out for yourself, and then uh, try to stop him from doing the haram. That's good. So I hope these are the six, roughly, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Nevertheless, Al-Imam al-Shawkani, may Allah have mercy on his soul, went a bit further and he said, I don't agree with these six exceptions because 
you can warn people in most of them, other than the police and the judge stuff. When someone asks you for your opinion about what do you think of Sheikh so-and-so who gives tafsir or who teaches aqidah or who teaches fiqh, and I know that he's not good to teach, not because I'm jealous of him, not because he's making a lot of money, simply because we have the facts in black and white. He's not qualified. He has corrupt aqidah. He's been deviant for so many years. If I can warn people who trust me and seek my advice without mentioning his flaws. So he says, Sheikh, can I learn Arabic from so-and-so? And I say, I don't advise you to do so. He says, why? He said, Akhi, you asked me for advice? I gave you my advice. You want to know why? You have to do your homework. I'm not going to go deeper than that. This, as Imam Shokani says, is a higher and better stance when you warn people, and Allah knows best. Sarah from the U.S. She says, people are enjoying life. After we migrated to the U.S., I'm finding it difficult to pray as I used to pray and enjoy reading the Quran and making dhikr. Everything around me is filled with fitna. Even my siblings, my own brothers, who used to pray in the masjid and go to uh, circles of Quran uh, memorization and be students of knowledge, now they've drifted far, far away from Islam. And I am worried what to do. Unfortunately, Sarah, this is the price you have to pay when you look for a better life, quote unquote, underline, exclamation marks. It, when you look for a better income, when you jeopardize your Islam by going to a Kafir country like that, I get counseling sessions every day, alhamdulillah. And 40% of these counseling sessions about their children, how they drifted, how they've deviated. We get calls from parents weeping over their daughters and sons. What happened? They don't pray anymore. They don't want to talk about Islam. They raise their voices and sometimes physically fight with us whenever we try to tell them to do something that is Islam, Islamic or to stay away from th something that is haram. And we don't know what to do. Akhi, how can I help you? You are trying to cure the symptoms while neglecting the core illness. Someone who has cancer, someone who has a chronic illness and complains of headaches, giving him Tylenol or aspirin or Panadol or whatever would relieve him from his headache for an hour or two, then it reoccurs. Another pill, a third pill, a whole box. It would not cure the cancer. It would only cure the symptoms, which is the headaches. This is exactly what you're doing. Living in such kafir country, failing to install in your children from a very early age the knowledge of Allah, the love of Allah, the commitment to the deen. We fail to do this with our own children because we go out of our way to feed them well, to clothe them well, and to take them to the best schools. But spiritually, culturally, they don't have an identity. So they're torn between two lovers feeling like a fool. This is what's happening. They don't have a heritage to lean on or back to. All what they see is kufr, disbelief, temptation. So they fall prey to it and they become the victims. You have to go to the core of the problem and solve it if it's not already too late. So unfortunately, this requires a lecture, but I hope you understand what I'm hitting too. Muhammad from India, people live three buildings away from the masjid. So it's very close. But because they don't use loudspeakers, they cannot hear the adhan. 
So sometimes they're lazy and they do not come to the masjid and they justify this by saying, the Prophet said, do you hear the Adhan alayhi salam? And the blind man said, yes. So the Prophet said, you have to respond. You have to answer. So if we don't hear the Adhan, this means we don't have to answer. And this is not entirely true. This, the Prophet Islam was talking about a particular environment where they did not have uh, tall bu buildings, high buildings, and they did not have concrete buildings, and they did not have double glazed glass, air conditioners, cars, pollution, etc. This is where a person standing on top of the masjid calling the adhan as loud as he can what is the distance that would reach? This is something you have to figure out. Maybe it's like 10 minutes walk, which is almost a mile or a little bit less. So if you live within the radius of a mile from a masjid, it is mandatory for you to pray in the masjid, whether you hear the adhan or not. Karim from Holland, he says, I work and the masjid is far away. Can I pray at work? First of all, if they allow you to go to work, then you should go to work. Uh, excuse me, let me rephrase that. I hope they edit it. It's live, but it can be edited. So Karim, if your work allows you to go to the masjid and gives you time, you should go and pray in the masjid. If the masjid is within the vicinity, about 10 minutes or 14, 15 minutes walk. But if they don't allow you and they don't give you time off, then you have to pray at work on time, and if there are Muslims, try to invite them to pray with you in congregation. If you fail or they don't want to pray with you in congregation, pray on your own, and inshallah, it will be accepted. Masha from the US, she has a, uh, um, uh, a time deposit certificate or a saving certificate that has riba coming to it every month. What to do? The capital which you had paid for it, Keep it. So you started it with $1,000, keep the $1,000. The $200 interest that came to your account or to this certificate, you have to take it and dispose of it in means of charity, such as giving it to masjids, giving it to the poor who, doesn't, who don't find uh, medication or don't have the means to pay off the rent or electricity, etc. Any means of charity would do. Uh, Yusuf from Holland fermented Foods and drinks. Akhi, I cannot advise you in this without the proper knowledge. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu salam, whatever intoxicates in large quantities, small quantities are haram. So these fer fermented drinks, if they contain alcohol, and the experts say that if you drink a large portion of it, it would intoxicate you, it becomes haram. But if it doesn't, if it's like 0.3%, uh, percent, Alcohol, not wine, alcohol. And they say if you drink six or seven or eight bottles of it, nothing would happen to you. There is nothing wrong in that, inshallah. Hamza from Bosnia, he says that people keep dogs outside their homes chained. And they claim that these dogs are for guarding and protecting the houses, but they're chained. So is this permissible? This is between them and Allah. If these chained Dogs would actually bark if an intruder comes in. That would make the people of the house aware of such an intruder. And that would protect them. But if they're just keeping that dog as a form of being cool or uh, uh, being uh, uh, sophisticated like so many Muslims unfortunately are doing, this is haram. Um Abdul Rahman, she says that people that do illegal immigration and they take benefits and don't pay taxes. This is prohibited because they're breaking the law. They're lying and cheating to that Kafir country. But what they're doing is sinful and taking the benefits from the government illegally or by lying or by forging documents or claiming that they are oppressed when they're not, this is also haram for them. Muhammad from the Philippines, can a traveler combine? The answer is yes. A traveler can combine between Dhuhr and Asr as a set, either praying Asr at the time of Dhuhr with it, or delaying Dhuhr, praying it with Asr, delaying it at the time of Asr. And he can pray Maghrib and Isha, either 
praying Maghrib three rak'ahs at the time of Maghrib and then two rak'ahs afterwards of Isha at the time of Maghrib or delaying Maghrib, not praying it except at the time of Isha, then praying two rak'ahs of Isha afterwards. Louine from Canada, he says, can we give names to our pets? I says, yes, no problem. Is there any restriction? Not that I know of. Yani you should not call your cat Muhammad, for example, because this is an honorable name. You can call it whatever you wish that is permissible and not degrading to any uh, of the names that we um, honor in Islam. And Allah knows best. Ahnaf from Bangladesh, what's the difference between Quran, uh, the Hadith al-Qudsi, and the Sunnah? Quran is Allah's words that are not created, that Allah spoke with, and the meaning and the letters are totally from Allah Azza wa Jal. And you cannot pray except with the Quran. Al-Hadith al-Qudsi is an issue of dispute among scholars. The most authentic is that the words and the meaning are from Allah, but they are not as miraculous and challenging as the Quran. Allah has challenged people to produce like the Quran or one surah even. So it's challenging and it's miraculous. Al-Hadith al-Qudsi is not like that, but it is from Allah Azza wa Jal. And also Al-Hadith al-Qudsi, you cannot read it in the Quran. Uh, you cannot read it in the Salat. Uh, uh, you can uh, read it when you are in the major ritual impurity without a problem. Quran, you cannot. Sunnah, the meaning and the revelation is from Allah Azza wa Jal because the Prophet doesn't talk, alayhi wa except with Allah's approval. And the wording is from the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Muhammad from the U.S. says that he repeated all the prayers that he thought his ghusl was not valid due to stains of semen on his thigh. So he repeated all these prayers, like five or ten of them, in order, but when he took his ghusl, he took his time. So he didn't make it in one minute to rush and make up these prayers. He took his time, shampooed probably, and put some conditioner, whatever. And afterwards, when he prayed the ten prayers in order and sequence, he may have taken a gap between a prayer and, two, and the other to drink water, and, and, and a short gap, there's no problem with that, it's all valid. Nashim from the Philippines, he says he prays Fajr in home because the masjid is seven minutes far away from his house. This is not permissible. For a man, a seven minute far uh, uh, distance from the masjid is obligatory for you to pray there. For Ad from Bangladesh, I'm talking about walking distance, huh? So if it's seven minutes walking distance, you must pray in the masjid. For Ad from Bangladesh, he says, can we draw bacteria and uh, uh, germs and the, the likes and, and, and human cells and uh, the things like that, there's no problem in that because what's prohibited for us to draw are things such as human form, animals, birds, fish, living things. Bacteria are so negligible that we don't see them, especially for those who are forced to draw them due to their exams, to their studies, like medical doctors and, and, and the likes, and those who are studying biology. CD from Germany says, stunned meat. What's the ruling on that? Stun, stunning animals before slaughtering it is highly recommended by the disbelievers, the kuffar. And they think, they think that this is more merciful, which is totally bogus. But they're kuffar, they're disbelievers. They don't believe in the oneness of Allah. How would you expect him to believe in other than that? However, to us Muslims, it is prohibited to eat what is not slaughtered. So we cannot eat a sheep or a cow that was not slaughtered Islamically and properly. Now, stunning this animal either would sedate it would make it drowsy so that we can easily uh, slaughter it without it uh, fighting back. Or stunning it would electrocute it and kill it. 
If it's the latter, it's totally prohibited and haram, and you cannot eat that. If it's stunned just to make it weaker and controllable, and then we slaughter it while it's still living, while it's still alive but stunned. In this case, it is halal, though it's not recommended because this is a form of torturing the animal before actually slaughtering. Slaughtering it is the most merciful act you can do for that animal. But these people don't care. So if we don't know, Sheikh, well, if you don't know, to be safe, you have to investigate. Because at the end of the day, it's not a necessity. And unfortunately, I've heard that some European countries today only uh, issued a law that mandates stunning before slaughtering. If the stunning, the, the, the electric shock kills the animal, then it becomes totally haram and the Muslims there must object, must, must take all legal actions to fight this unfair resolution. And this is one step in many, many steps that would be enforced upon them to change their religion, beginning with niqab, beginning with their food, beginning with sexual uh, orientation and education for their children, so many things. The end result is you have to be in the same melting pot. You have to dispose of your Islam and of your religion if you want to stay here. And this is actually waging war against your religion. So you have to be civil. You have to be diplomatic, but take all legal actions possible to counter this and as I usually advise, if you can, get the heck out of here and go back to a Muslim country where you can live as a Muslim. This is all the time we have until we meet tomorrow Sunday at 4 o'clock. I leave, hopefully 4 o'clock. I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُو إِلَى اللَّهِ على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين